chọn lớp chọn yêu thương chọn hạnh phúc Yesterday, my wife and I were celebrating our 51st wedding anniversary. <laughs> and what we heard from uh, Professor Petro yesterday about uh, emotional coaching, tuning in, is on, not only for teacher and student, it's also for husband and wife. So if we want to promote it for others, we have to do it ourselves. So my wife and I, we had a, a very nice dinner, just the two of us, and we spent the whole evening talking, listening, sharing, memories, and so on. So uh, tuning in emotionally. And because we do that regularly, I think this is why we are still married after 51 years. <laughs> and eating is a very important part of uh, connecting. So if, if I'm well informed, in, in Vietnamese, you always use the word eating when you say uh, eating for the festival, eating for New Year, eating. So it's always eating, right? And we should think about why do we say that? I just wanted to, you know, start with reflecting. What is the connection between eating and emotional uh, connection? It's a very strong connection. It links together two very fundamental aspects, which is uh, meeting physiological needs, eating, most basic, and emotional needs, connecting. Usually in the morning, I get up earlier than my wife. And then I go and I prepare a cappuccino for her. Then I bring it to her bed. And then I sit next to her and we chat. So this is how we start every day together. So you see there's something about food, <laughs> drinking nice cappuccino and connecting, tuning in emotionally. And that makes a whole difference. It doesn't have to be long, we, maybe 10 minutes. But then the whole day is very different than, you know, if you get up and you get dressed and you go away, you say bye-bye, and no connection, right? And especially when you have been together for a long time, you need to renew, to refresh the connection regularly. <laughs> <laughs> So that was the introduction. But it's directly connected to what I want to show you now. This picture looks very complex, and it's a bit uh, confusing, but I'm going to walk you through it step by step, and then you will also receive it. It's just like a visual to remember the key points of social and emotional learning. The center is uh, about uh, awareness training, mindfulness, observing ourselves observing our emotions. And then the, the blue lines are the three connections. True happiness is being connected to ourselves, connected to others, and connected to the planet, to the environment, to nature. The red five-pointed star are the five fundamental skills of emotional intelligence, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and ethical decision-making. Because if we want to have these three connections with self, others, and, um, and nature, what are the skills that we need to develop to be able to do that? These are the five skills. And these skills, they answer to five fundamental needs, five conditions that have to be met so that a child and even a grown-up person be really can fully unfold their potential. And today, I will start by looking at these five conditions, five fundamental needs, and explain them to you. And around, you have nine domains that were developed in Bhutan to measure the happiness of the country, but we can also use them to measure the, the happiness of a city, of a school, of an organization, even of a family, or even my own happiness. So today, we will not discuss these nine, because this is a theme in itself, but just that you know in the background, yes, we do have a, a measuring methodology, a survey methodology that helps us to assess the well-being of an organization, of a school, or a family even. Okay, so now let us look at the 
uh, these five fundamental needs that we have as human beings, and they are even more pronounced for children. The first one is obviously the physiological needs, right? If the physiological needs are not met, then of course there cannot be happiness and well-being. It is very interesting to observe the difference between little animals and little humans. Because on one hand, we humans are definitely the most dominant species on Earth. Yet, at the same time, when you look at a newborn baby, there's nothing as vulnerable, as helpless as a newborn baby. And so, if you look, a little animal, like in the wild, for instance, as soon as they, a little mammal, as soon as they top, stop drinking mother's milk, they are able to feed themselves. Little humans, for many, many, many years, if adults, the mother, the parents, and other caregiver would not take care of them, feed them, they would die. They would, would be, for many years, totally unable to even feed themselves. So there's a great vulnerability in little humans. And so, the little human instinctively knows that he or she is completely dependent on the care of the adult. Therefore, the satisfaction of physiological needs is connected with emotional security. Because it is, I am confident that my mother loves me, she's going to feed me. If I don't have emotional security, it's an existential fear. So it touches the reptilian brain, existential fear. If there's no love, there will be no food. And we heard from Dr. Pekcho when we spoke about bullying, if this primary attachment, so emotional connection, is broken, is not there, the whole life we might suffer from it. Uh, how many mothers do we have in the room? <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> so as mothers, you know, how do you show your love? You cook something nice for your family. <laughs> you see, so emotional attachment and food is very connected. My father passed away 12 years ago. I came to his deathbed and I held his hand the last minutes or hours of his life. He was still conscious. He looked at me and he said, have you eaten today? This is how strong our instinct as parents, our love. I was already, what, 60 years old. I was not a baby. <laughs> he was on his deathbed, but he cared. Have you eaten today? This is how attachment is so strong and connects emotional security with physiological needs. And the reason why I say that is because we have to realize that if we are not able to create a space of emotional security, for instance, in our classroom, then actually it's the very survival instinct that is threatened in the children, right? Not because you don't feed them, but because emotional security is connected with survival experience. Dr. Pekcho explained the functioning of the brain and we will revise it today because in order to understand these things, we need to be very clear how the brain functions. Emotional security is not only linked with physiological need, it's also linked with our need for social belonging. Because instinctively, we know that as human beings, we cannot survive alone. We could only survive as a humankind because we created uh, connections, families, tribes, clans, nation, whatever, but social connection. This is why in our classroom, we have to create a sense of belonging, that the children feel they are accepted, they are included, they are part of a family, and it can give them emotional security. So emotional security is not only a one-on-one, -on -one, it's also a collective field. So maybe um, we can give two examples, stories that we actually experienced in, in Happy School in Hue. Thì cái hình ảnh đầu tiên 
Đó là một trường tiểu học Mọi người đang cùng với nhau tích hợp trường học hạnh phúc Vào việc là giáo dục cho trẻ em gái Các em lớp 5 Về việc bảo vệ bản thân khỏi cái việc uh, Bị uh, lạm dụng cơ thể, lạm dụng uh, tình dục Thì bởi vì mình thực hành cái việc Để cho các em chia sẻ cảm xúc và lắng nghe sâu với nhau Thế nên các em, các em đã có thể chia sẻ được những cái điều rất là nhạy cảm và thầm kín Và đảm bảo được rằng cái sự an toàn là các bạn sẽ giữ lại những cái gì đó chia sẻ ở đó thì ở đó Thì đó là cái bước thứ nhất Nó vừa đảm bảo về bảo, đảm bảo vệ về mặt cơ thể nhưng mà cũng đảm bảo rằng cái sự thuộc về của các bạn cũng như an toàn cảm xúc Cái thứ hai đó là các bạn cấp 3 Thì trong cái giờ sinh hoạt lớp hàng tuần thay vì cái việc chỉ chia sẻ và hoạt động lớp các cô sẽ để ra 10 đến 15 phút ở trong bàn với nhau các bạn chia sẻ về câu chuyện hàng hàng tuần có gì diễn ra và cũng thực hành một số cái nguyên tắc về bảo mật thông tin và chia sẻ cảm xúc. Thì hàng tuần đều làm như vậy và xây dựng được một cái lớp học nó đồng đồng điệu với nhau hơn, đồng cảm với nhau. So you see these are relatively simple things that you can implement right away to support this need of emotional security and sense of belonging in the uh, classroom. And the next one is learning and development. So when, again, you look at, lit at a little animal, a young, um, especially wild animals, but even with domesticated animals, it's like that. When you look at a young animal, you can predict very, quite precisely how this little animal will behave because it is genetically determined by the shape of the body. When the mom or the dad holds the little baby in their arms, they cannot say what's, who this little baby is going to become. It, can, it could become a great artist, it could become uh, a criminal, it could become uh, a statesperson, it could become a very simple worker. We don't know because everything all the possibilities are there, and what the child will become depends, by and large, what the child will learn and how the child will develop. So learning, schooling, education, is not only just passing grades, getting exams, is unfolding the full potential of this child that is, we don't know yet what this child will become. So, a little dog is born a dog. A little horse is born a horse. A little tiger is born a tiger. A little human is not yet human. We become human. Human is a process of becoming. It's not a ready-made thing. And one of the most important determination for becoming human is that we can learn. We are the only species who can learn throughout their life. So, when I was a student, a long time ago, I was told our uh, brain plasticity, our ability to create new pathways, ends when we become 20-something. Now, science says, no, it's not true. Brain plasticity continues throughout the life. But, until you are 20-something, it's a natural phenomenon. It's just biological new pathways are created in the brain. As adults, we have to do it. It doesn't happen alone. So the brain and uh, our learning, either it goes up or it goes down. Either we continue to learn throughout our life or gradually our brain starts to de generate. So I, I'm 72 and I feel I'm still learning every day. I hope. Otherwise, <laughs> it's very bad for me. <laughs> so, when we are aware of that, we realize the task of educators, of teachers, is very big because it's about creating a mindset that the students will have this curiosity, this appetite for learning that will continue throughout their life. If we just work for exam, as soon as the exam is finished, if you have passed it, you forget it. It's not interesting anymore. But the mindset of learning, that you are curious, you want to understand more, you want to develop, you want to broaden your mind, this is a fundamental mindset that is the key for a good life. And this determines the next fundamental condition for a fulfilled human life and a fundamental need, 
which is ethical values. Because again, if you look at the behavior of an animal, it doesn't make any sense to say the animal is good or bad. The animal follows instinct. When the lion is hungry, the lion will eat the antelope. Once the lion is, has filled its stomach, he will not kill for the pleasure. It's just instinct. You cannot say the lion is, uh, is cruel. The lion is not cruel. The lion is following its instinct. Right? But we human, our behavior is not determined by instinct. It has to be determined by ethical values. So what does it mean for school? Again, uh, a few stories. Đây là một ví dụ, đó là các bạn sẽ cùng với nhau uh, suy nghĩ, cô, cô tạo ra không gian cho các bạn chia sẻ, vậy thì làm sao mình tạo ra một cái lớp học mà ở đó tất cả các bạn cảm thấy thoải mái và an toàn, thì các bạn mới ghi ra một số cái uh, từ khóa, thì có lắng nghe, có yêu thương, có giữ bí mật cho nhau, có giúp đỡ, thì nó trở thành một cái thỏa thuận chung của lớp. Nhưng mà sau đó các bạn sẽ xác định thành những cái hành động, thì ví dụ như là mỗi ngày các bạn đều làm, ở dưới là các bạn cùng với nhau phân công nhau dọn vệ sinh thì chuyện này rất là bình thường để chăm sóc cho lớp học giúp đỡ cho nhau cái hình thứ hai thì đó là hình ảnh của một bạn học sinh có nhu cầu đặc biệt bạn ấy có bị khó nói nhưng mà trong lớp học bởi vì cô giáo hướng dẫn cho các bạn có sự lắng nghe nên cho dù rằng là các bạn ấy chỉ nói một vài từ cả lớp vẫn lặng lẽ lặng yên chờ đợi cho người bạn của mình được lên tiếng và các bạn cùng với nhau thực hành cái sự lắng nghe bằng cách là bắt cặp giống như mọi người vừa bắt cặp á, và ôn tập bài tập trước khi mà mình đi thi và cái yêu, cái yêu cầu đó là mình chỉ giúp bạn nghe cái phần của bạn thôi và mình sẽ nói là điều gì bạn đang làm tốt để mà nuôi dưỡng cho nhau thì cứ lặp đi lặp lại quan trọng là lặp đi lặp lại More stories. <cười> còn đây á, là cái việc là xây dựng một cái hệ giá trị mà thông xuyên suốt từ tiểu học cho đến cấp 3 trong việc bảo vệ môi trường thì các bạn thực chất là từ tiểu học các bạn làm những cái bì để bọc bánh mì á tuy là chỉ là cho vui thôi nhưng mà các bạn xây dựng được cái nhận thức và mang ra căng tin để mà đưa cho các cô tức là các bạn cảm thấy các bạn đóng góp được cô lên cấp 2 á thì các bạn mới quyết định á là các bạn sẽ trong những cái buổi mà đi giả ngoại các bạn sẽ tự đội mang đồ ăn của mình và san sẻ với nhau đóng hộp thay vì mà mua đồ nhựa và lên cấp 3 thì các bạn là buổi sáng các bạn mang cà men của mình thì ở cấp 1 là mỗi ngày thứ tư là mỗi ngày không đi lông còn các ở cấp à, cấp 3 là mỗi ngày thứ bảy là bữa sáng xanh không mang đồ nhựa mà mang đồ ăn của mình và sang với nhau sang sẻ với nhau come back to the drawing that I showed in the beginning so these are these green lines these five fundamental conditions that needs to be fulfilled so that the child can really unfold. But even as adults, we also need that. So when we work with companies, we work with organizations, we also use that. Because it's not that once we are adult, we don't need that anymore. We still need that. A, a very simple exercise that helps us remember how the, work, the brain functions. So I would like everybody to hold their right hand up. Just here, here, next to your head. This is the spinal cord, and this is the brain stem. Now put your thumb inside. This is the limbic system, amygdala and hippocampus. Now close your hand. This is the cortex, cerebral cortex. And this part in front is the prefrontal cortex. Hold it like that, you have an image of your brain. Okay, thank you. So let us remember what the functions of the different parts of the brain are. Spinal cord and brain stem are the reptilian brain. And the reptilian brain has only four possibilities. Fight, flight, freeze, or faint. Now, in our brain, we have mirror neurons. It means whatever happens in the brain of the person in front of me is mirrored in my own brain. This is the biological foundation for empathy. So if I act out of my reptilian brain, 
means I'm getting aggressive, it triggers the reptilian brain of the person in front of me. So for instance, if I shout at a, at a child, you stupid, you are good for nothing. I told you, you should not do that. It's, with, it's fight mode. So how can the child react? Either fight, but he's too small, he cannot. Flight, he cannot. So he freezes most of the time. And when they become teenagers, they might fight back and shout back at you. <laughs> or go out of the room and slam the door. This is all reptilian brain. So the next one that was here. The next one is a limbic system, amygdala and hippocampus. It's a bit more evolved. So this one is about 300 million years old. And this one, a little younger, 200 million years old. And so we've heard from um, Dr. Pectro that uh, emotions are so important. Why? Because emotions are like the interface between the brainstem and the cerebral cortex. So the higher so cerebral cortex is the more evolved part of the brain where thinking happens, rational mind, and so on. And emotion is like the connection between the two. And there can be two different kinds of connections. And um, uh, Dr. Pectro showed very interestingly these two possibilities of vertical activation, which is reptilian brain gets activated, and the emotions is the expression of the, of the uh, reptilian brain, like anger or, you know, things like that. This is, but then there's also a very different kind of emotions, like uh, gratitude, kindness, generosity. And this connects the limbic system with the prefrontal cortex, which is the most evolved part of the brain. So this is why the, the beautiful example that we saw with the uh, uh, sound of music, right? Uh, so the little girl, she was in a fear, which is existential mode. And because Maria was able to welcome the emotion and connect and acknowledge the emotion, so she could connect the emotion with the higher part of the brain, you see? And the little girl could relax in, because it, from a vertical activation, it came to a horizontal act activation where the prefrontal cortex integrates all the different parts of the brain. So as teacher, we have to learn to understand how it works and observe it in ourselves, because it's not only in children. I will give you an example. In, in Switzerland, I work with a, like a very big energy company, and I work with their board of director. And they are all very successful people, very powerful, strong egos, and when they sit together, there's a lot of arguments, and they have a very difficult time listening to one another. So we explained that to them, and we agreed on a hand signal. One notice that they are leaving the integrated mode and going in the you know, <laughs> reptilian mode, then they do this hand signal. <laughs> And the others know, oh, <laughs> yes, I, I have to be a little bit careful. <laughs> so it means like, we call that flipping the lid. You know, the control is gone, boop, <laughs> then whoom, the aggression comes out. So just, you don't have to say be quiet. Just, mm -mm. <laughs> the question is, how do we learn to practice so that we are able to strengthen this horizontal integration where both instincts, emotions, thoughts, and, uh, and higher purpose are united. This sounds a bit abstract, a bit scientific. You could think the children cannot understand that, but I think children can understand that. I get really mad when my brother hits me a lot. I don't like it when you say you don't want to play with me. When I'm mad, my brain can get a headache, and it can start hurting. Your blood keeps pumping because you're like really mad. And you start to get sweaty because you're getting really, really mad. And then when you start getting really mad, you turn red. When your body can't really control yourself, mad just takes over your body. I just get out of control. <laughs> 
it's kind of like if you had a jar and then the jar would be your brain and then you put glitter in the jar and that would be how you would feel. Like if you shook up the jar and the glitter went everywhere, that would be how your mind looks. And it's like spinning around and then you don't have any time to think. And you sometimes punch stuff and people when you don't really mean it. When I get angry, I feel it in my heart. I really don't like when I get angry. The amygdala really reacts, but the prefrontal cortex tries to keep it down. When I like feel like I wanna, you know, get really angry and yell, I just like sometimes, you know, like take a deep breath. Like first you find a place where you can be alone. Then you find some way to relax and calm down. When I need to calm down, I take deep breaths. I breathe in through my nose. Sometimes I close my eyes or just take deep breaths. It's like it's coming down, it's like not like moving. It's like slowing down and then it stops. And the heart plumps slow and then it goes into your brain. It's like all the sparkles are at the bottom of your brain. My brain like slows down and then like I feel more calm and then I'm like ready to speak to them that person. Of course, as teacher, it is uh, part of our job to point out, you know, what uh, children still need to develop, to learn, and to understand, and support them when they have weaknesses. Of course, it's part of our job. But now that we have understood the importance of emotional connection, of empathy, of listening, then we also understand the importance of uh, positive feedback, of positive reinforcement, because this creates emotional security that the child needs in order to learn properly. Because now we understand that if we trigger fear, it triggers the reptilian brain, and that's not the brain that can learn properly. But if we trigger confidence, that strengthens the horizontal integration, and that's the best possible foundation for relearning. Not just rot learning, but relearning. So this is why we speak of pedagogy of success. We focus on the abilities, on the potential, on what can be developed, on the positive aspects, and reinforce that as our main task. And to end, we'll share just a few stories how we do that practically in the classroom. Thì đây là cái hình ảnh của cái thẻ gọi là thẻ siêu năng lực. Tức là vào cuối học kỳ thường các bạn sẽ nhận được uh, sổ liên lạc, phiếu, phiếu, phiếu báo điểm, phiếu liên lạc của các bạn. Thì ngoài trong cái cuộc họp phụ huynh, á, phụ huynh sẽ ngoài việc nhận được cái phiếu liên lạc về thành tích học tập, các cô cũng sẽ tặng uh, gửi cho phụ huynh cái siêu năng lực của con mình. Siêu năng lực ở đây thậm chí là biết nói lời xin lỗi hay dọn dẹp giúp đỡ bạn, có khả năng lắng nghe một cái ôm rất ấm. Tức là nhìn thấy những cái điểm thật sự rất nhỏ của bạn và xem nó là một cái siêu năng lực, ghi nhận nó. Và người phụ huynh cũng được biết điều đó. Ở phía dưới là hình ảnh của giáo viên làm siêu năng lực cho chính mình. Bởi vì trong lúc mà tập huấn rất là nhiều giáo viên nói rằng là tôi mất cái niềm vui trong nghề, nghề. thì chúng em thực hiện cái bài tập này để giúp cho mọi người viết lại cái cái điểm đẹp ở mình. 
và được chia sẻ về nó. Còn ở đây là các bạn cấp 2, thì trước khi mà các bạn thi học kỳ 2, á, thì cô giáo thấy rằng là các bạn rất là lo lắng và sợ hãi. Thế là cô mới nói bây giờ mỗi người viết xuống cái siêu năng lực của mình, dán lên trên tường và chia sẻ. Rồi tất cả mọi người trong lớp tới và viết thêm vào cho bạn mình cái siêu năng lực của bạn. Người bạn đó được đem về thì nó củng cố lại cái niềm tin và cái cảm giác tích cực sẵn sàng bước vào kỳ thi. Thì đó là một uh, vài câu chuyện ạ. Còn đây đó là ở tiểu học. Tức là sau khi mà các bạn thi học kỳ uh, và cô giáo cũng nhận ra là các bạn đang rất là lo lắng. Thì các bạn được viết, cô, cô mời các bạn viết xuống ba điều mà các bạn thấy đẹp ở bản thân. Các bạn đã tiến bộ trong cái học kỳ vừa rồi. Chỉ là để các bạn tự nhận ra cái điểm tốt đẹp của mình. Và sau đó thì chia sẻ với nhau để tạo ra một cái không khí nhẹ nhàng hơn, đỡ sợ hãi hơn trong lớp học. Dạ. Yeah. Thì đó là một số ví dụ. So these are simple example to show the connection between the theory, the scientific background, and what actually happens in the classroom to put it into practice. And so you can be as creative as you want to invent new ways to do it. Toàn bộ các phần trình bày và thảo luận sẽ được phát sóng trên kênh YouTube của VTV7. Các thầy cô giáo, các nhà quản lý giáo dục, các khán giả quan tâm có thể theo dõi.